almost anyone was sitting here in April of 2020, I think people were assuming that there would just be brutal uh, budget fights. Budget bonanza, the state of Florida flush with money, including some from Biden. And the reality is uh, we're in an incredibly strong position. The governor doling out dollars. Democrats push back. This is, is simply a budget that's a re-election budget. I don't think we've ever had $15 billion uh, in state reserves, which is larger than the size of many state budgets. What it means for you. From the lawmakers who will decide. We need to work very, very hard to bring back the coalition of voters that is going that we're going to need to win. Florida Democrats chart strategy heading toward election year, but now it's come from behind. South Florida to the rescue. We'll be sending a series of 18-wheeler uh, trucks uh, there. On the ground in the tornado's wake. And there's always hope, there's always light at the end of the tunnel. Kane's changes. I'm excited beyond words, man. I want to get to work. The future of football at the U. Good morning. Glad you could join us. I'm Michael Putnam. I'm Glenna Milberg. We begin today by following the money. Governor Ron DeSantis presented his budget plan this week, almost $100 billion worth, just shy of this week, uh, year's budget. Uh, though it's flush with raises and bonuses and even a gas tax holiday. The governor is able to do many of these things thanks to billions of dollars in COVID relief money from the Biden administration, which he criticizes all the time. So a plan's a plan. Lawmakers have to approve it. And today we have two South Florida senators here to take that dive with us. Anna Maria Rodriguez, Republican from Miami-Dade. She is also chair of the Miami-Dade delegation. And Chevron Jones, a Democrat from Broward, both friends of This Week in South Florida. So great to have you on the program. Senators, good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Senator Rodriguez, let's begin with you. You are the chair of the Miami-Dade delegation, so I'm going to defer to you at first. All right, here we've got this $99.7 billion budget the governor has proposed. It's really a whopper. Uh, overall, what do you think of it? Well, Michael, I think it's a, it's an excellent um, blueprint for the legislature to work with. Uh, at the end of the day, the legislature has um, the final say, and then, of course, the governor either pa uh, approves or vetoes what we uh, end up passing. But the governor's budget is always released before the legislative budget. So I think it has a lot of positive aspects. Um, I'm, I'm reassured uh, to see all the uh, funding that's going toward um, helping our law enforcement uh, remain, you know, top of mind, our, our first responders, our teachers who are so critically important um, for our kids. Um, I think it is, it's, it's a great start, uh, but it's not the end. So I, um, I think from this point forward, we just need to uh, kind of shape it up and, and decide, you know, what we're going to keep and what we're going to trim down. So those are some of, in your perspective, some of the winning parts of the budget, Chevron Jones, uh, the opposition party. Mm -hmm. What are some of your winners and losers? And, and what do you think? You know what, uh, then, uh, what I will say is the one good that the governor uh, didn't do when it comes to education, uh, that goes to our poor people spending next year and by him increasing that by $200. And that would bring the average uh, spent on each of Florida's 2.7 million uh, kids to about $8,000. So which that is a record amount. But we must, the governor has to be very honest because uh, this budget is packed with uh, federal stimulus funds from the Biden administration. And that's the same administration that, uh, that the governor has uh, criticized on Fox News, uh, those same dollars that they have gotten from the American Rescue Plan. The governor won't even acknowledge the fact that those dollars are federal dollars that came from President Joe Biden. That thousand dollars that's going to police and, um, and firefighters, the money that's going to our, our teachers. All of that, those dollars are from the American Rescue Plan and the governor yeah. should at least acknowledge that. Yeah, Chevron, uh, you are a former uh, school teacher, you still I'm very involved in education policy. Uh, you know, I know some teachers, I saw statements from the teachers union uh, in South Florida, both unions, Miami-Dade, Broward, uh, they were not crazy about the budget. They liked the fact that there is a thousand dollar bonus for a lot of teachers, which continues a policy. 
But I know one veteran teacher who says they're neglecting veteran teachers. This teacher told me her pay raise in the budget is 0.03%. So if you're a new teacher, you're going to do well. If you're a veteran teacher, maybe not so well. Well, and, and, and you're right, Michael. Uh, the problem is our teachers don't need bonuses. Our teachers need pay raises. Uh, what our teachers went through uh, with COVID and what they had to deal with when it comes to teaching children virtually uh, and then go back into classrooms, uh, and some of them, went, well, that wasn't safe for them to go back. Uh, yeah, our teachers, we they need raises. The, the $1,000 it won't be here for them next year. And so we need to work hard. The $15 billion that, that's in reserve, which is a record amount of money that is in reserve, that truthfully told, that's that we don't need to save that money like I mean, it, it, that it's, a, it's such a bulk way. I mean, we can do some great things with that. We can give the teachers the raises. We can deal with affordable housing. But the governor has to, again, he has to be honest and making sure he's working with both sides on what's made sense. And I will say something that Senator Rodriguez made mention of. The governor's budget is just a blueprint. The legislature is going to have to come and present their budget and figure out is this the best route for us to take. Uh, Anna Maria Rodriguez, I want to talk a little bit about the, the um, ARA money, the American Rescue Plan money that's in this budget, because we've heard, you know, the governor, if you watch what he does, it's an almost daily press conference, mm -hmm. and he's been touting a lot of the really great things that are very popular among them, a six-month gas tax holiday and those bonuses for teachers and first responders. And he's been promoting these um, to wild applause. And all of those sort of icing on the cake things he is able to do, do come from that pot of federal COVID relief money. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been talking about how he hasn't mentioned that. He had such a kumbaya moment in Surfside with the president uh, after that catastrophe that sort of went away and, and now he's on a war path against the administration. What do you, what do you make of that? Well, Glenna, let's be clear. Um, this is not Joe Biden's money. This is taxpayer dollars. This is our money. The state of Florida has many, many Floridians who pay a lot of taxes. And I believe that this is money that is due to us. Um, you know, the, the way that the monies were distributed initially had to do with the number of unemployment um, cases in each state. And because Florida is such a well-run state, our cases didn't match up to New York and California and other uh, states who are not run like the way Florida is. And so in essence, Florida was shortchanged um, with the ARA money. And so what, Gov what Governor DeSantis is basically doing is, is fine. I think he's, you know, he's claiming what's due to us. He um, is in a position where you know, he's, he's fighting for what belongs to Floridians. And I think that that's, that's not something he should be ashamed of. Yeah. His policies, al although are being spun as you know, political spins, um, they are just sound, good policies for, for all Floridians. Uh, you know, and so I, I just see it in a different lens. And, and I think that, um, you know, we need to, you know, fight for what's ours. Yeah, well, policy and politics, as we know, are sort of indivisible. And especially in an election year, Anna Maria, you know, the governor, obviously, we saw in the clip earlier, is calling this his freedom first budget. It's kind of a cute phrase, but it's part of his reelection campaign. Florida, the free state of Florida, and so on. Now, I'm not naive about politics, but, you know, frankly, um, I find it kind of annoying. This is not really a budget about freedom. It's about a budget about funding essential government services. Well, Michael, you know, I, I think, you know, the name that they came up with, you know, to, to talk about it was just something that, you know, to make it a catchy, you know, something for people to talk about. But at the end of the day, it does um, address many of Floridians, um, not just our basic needs, but, uh, you know, to help stimulate the economy, the economy and um, really retain people in key positions that, that need to be retained. Uh, and so, um, you know, I personally think it's good. I think Florida is one of the freest states in the, in the nation. And um, I think he's excited and proud of that. So, um, you know, it's, it's um, beauty's in the eye of the beholder, I guess. <laughs> Marketing is a, is a pretty common thing when it comes to politics anyway. Um, so Chevron Jones, you mentioned the $15 billion in reserves. There were other Democratic lawmakers who took issue with that as well. But, you know, in this state, we face emergencies and crises and catastrophes on a quasi-regular basis. 
wouldn't $15 billion in reserve be a, a good thing? Yeah, you know, I, and let me and let me correct myself. I mean, the fifteen billion dollars in reserve is great, but what I'm saying is that the, the services and the things that we need currently right now within the state of Florida, like the teacher pay raises, uh, like the, uh, our health care, and making sure we deal with the nursing shortage that we're dealing with. I mean, those, those are dollars that we need to make sure that we are responsibly dealing with. Um, as we go forward into a into a new year, the, the nursing shortage is not going is not going to go anywhere. The teacher shortage is not going to go anywhere. It's more than just giving out bonuses. We have to make sure that we're paying individuals to be able to stay in the state of Florida. I believe Representative Carlos Guillermo Smith said it best that Florida is becoming too expensive for Floridians. Become too expensive for Floridians. Yes. Yes, yeah. but it's coming too expensive. It's, it's too expensive. You look at the affordable housing prices. Yeah. You look at the yeah. rent prices that we're dealing with yeah. right well, now. Well, let me, if, if I could, Chef, let, let, me, let me jump in there. I beg your pardon. Uh, the governor made a point of saying that they've got $356 million in this budget for affordable housing. And for the first time in years, he says lawmakers will not be raiding the Sadowski Housing Trust Fund, which they excuse me, you guys normally go into, take millions out of when you have shorts, uh, you know, a shortfall elsewhere. So, uh, Chevron, uh, I mean, the governor did address affordable housing. Yeah, but uh, Michael, the governor's uh, assertion that his budget fully funds affordable housing is not, is a fact case. Uh, seeing as in the 2021 legislative session, the state slated its annual commitment to the Sadowski Fund for affordable housing by 50% meaning that the governor is only needing half of the obligation but taking credit for full funding. And so the when you look at the $15 billion in reserve, Governor DeSantis has mentioned in his budget, is, is really, again, I keep saying, it, it's a little bit unnecessary because hundreds of millions of dollars from, from that will go a long way toward easing affordable housing crunches and for Medicaid expansion and proving commercial rent, uh, commercial rent relief up to struggling small businesses, like in my district, in the Miami Gardens. There are many small businesses who are looking for relief, who need relief in order to get back on their feet since COVID. Anna Maria Rodriguez, one of the biggest winners in this budget was the health and human services portion of the budget, the, the biggest increase from year to year in the entire budget. Um, and a portion of that, let's see, health care, 1.2 billion more this year. Um, and it looks like that's because of the spike in Medicaid enrollments. Now 5 million Floridians are on Medicaid. So it's always been curious to me, that said, and with what the governor put in this budget for that, why recurringly does the state not take federal Medicaid money for the expansion? Well, the, the state usually, has, for many years, as you said, has been um, not taking this money. Um, it's something that uh, we've, we've been doing for years. And part of the reason why we don't take that money is because we, we don't want to have a, a debt with the federal government. Uh, and so I think that, you know, we try to work within our budget. We try to work within the funds that we have available. And that's something that, that we're going to continue to try to keep doing. And so the governor has um, worked, you know, again, you know, with the 3.5 billion that we're that we're trying to get for this for this year only, uh, but in, uh, but this is something that we I believe because we're such a conservative legislature in the House and in the Senate that um, this will probably continue for for the next session as well. Yeah, State Senator Anna Maria Rodriguez and Chevron Jones, Senator from Broward County. Everybody, hold your places. We've got a lot more questions for you. We'll be back in just a minute. We are so glad you are with us this morning. State Senator Anna Maria Rodriguez of South Miami-Dade, Senator Chevron Jones, Democrat from West Park. We should say Senator Rodriguez is a Republican, chair of the Miami-Dade delegation. Um, let's talk about one proposal in the budget. It's not a big one, three and a half million dollars. But Chevron Jones, uh, the governor wants this money to be used to start a state militia, about 200 people who would get some kind of training, who knows what, and then they would report directly to him. This would be his own kind of army. And uh, uh, 
what about this? Is that a good idea or is that uh, a dangerous idea? I think it's problematic on the surface. Uh, I, think, I don't think it's needed. I think we have uh, the, uh, the Army Guards. We have uh, a great uh, service that's already here within the state of Florida. Uh, the governor taken $3 million to create a militia of individuals who only answer directly to him, um, especially in a time to where we know uh, police is and communities are are not at a in a good place right now. Specifically, uh, more within the communities that I serve, uh, within the Miami Gardens, Oklahoma area, uh, there are black communities all across the state of Florida, across this country. Uh, and the governor knows we don't need this. What what will this militia do? You know, who are they for? And I can tell you now, there are some of my Republican colleagues who also don't uh, are not keen on us spending three million dollars on this. Ana Maria Rodriguez, uh, there, there is another side to that. Do you want to handle that? Yes, um, I, I think it's important to note that, you know, yes, I, I think we should invest more in law enforcement and criminal justice. Um, I don't necessarily think um, that the state needs to have its own um, state guard, per se. Um, I'd rather see that money spent toward um, local law enforcement departments, who I think are already doing a great job. Um, and I think that if anything, we should just help them in, in their efforts. Um, the other thing is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of Governor DeSantis and, and I think he's doing a great job. And he may get reelected uh, in, in his next term. But if we create this type of system and let's say the next person who becomes governor isn't someone that people like, well, then that person's going to have control of this of this uh little army, so to speak. Uh, so um, you just have to think about that. You know, it's not about who's in office. It's about thinking about the long term effects of what yeah. that may have. Yeah. Uh, Senator Rodriguez, um, clearly a hot button issue in this country for at least the last 50 years since the Roe versus Wade decision has been abortion. And there has been an early bill filed, I believe, in the House that sort of mimics the Texas bill uh, you told me told me earlier when you and Chevron and Representative Nick Duran and I had a discussion earlier this week that you don't think in the state Senate that there's much of an appetite or interest, you know, to sort of get into the abortion issue in this session. Is that right? Why and why is that? Well, I, I think that the abortion issue um, is an important one, and I think that at some point the state um, should bring it up. Um, I have not seen any legislation on the Senate side that would mirror the House bill that you're referring to. Um, I also think that we're waiting on the, the Supreme Court decision right. as to you know what's gonna happen. Um, and I think that will pretty much lay the groundwork as to what we do during the next session. Additionally, um, we're entering into an election year. Um, and I also think that on election years, it's a little bit less likely for us to take up such hot, uh, hot button issues. Yeah, Chevron, I wanted to ask you one question. You spoke about the education budget before. Ed education budget is increased this year, although fractionally, um, not, not really anything to write home about, yet it is more than less. But what is less is early learning, is, uh, is in this budget, early money for early learning, half a million dollars less than last year. What do you make of that? I think, well, one, we need to make sure that we are invested in our early learning. Um, and the, the federal government uh, actually, uh, within the American Rescue Plan, gave dollars, uh, and I can't remember the amount, uh, gave a great deal of dollars for early learning. And so I'm very curious to understand why the state of Florida, why we are slashing our early learning budget and not actually increasing it. Uh, and I and also believe that as we look at uh, our, our current education system and making sure that we're building that strong foundation for our young people to transition into uh, our K through 12 uh, system, that is one that should be a non-negotiable that we that we deal with. Now, again, I don't think we're going to see that slash in early learning in the legislature uh, from the, as far as the Senate and House because every year the House and the Senate have increased uh, the early learning um, dollars because they understand the, the, ne the necessity of it. Anna Maria Rodriguez, what do you what do you make of that? Do you agree? No, um, actually, um, from what I'm seeing um, in my notes, um, the governor's proposed budget has $1.4 billion um, for funding in early childhood education and um, more than $406 million for uh, the VPK program. So 
while it is a little bit less, um, I think that there are so many things on the table on the education sphere that need to be funded um, that, yes, it is important, but uh, we also need to fund all the other things that, that are on in the pipeline. Yeah. Uh, Anna Maria, Surfside is way far away from your South Day district, and yet, of course, the collapse, the tragic collapse in which 98 people died and that unbelievable tragedy uh, is very much on your mind, I know, and you have a, a series, a group of bills that you are introducing, may have already introduced, that would deal to try to prevent, uh, through new laws, any similar kind of tragedy. Tell us about what you are proposing. So the bills that I've proposed, Michael, are not so much related to construction, but more on the condominium management side. And so one of my bills has to do with um, creating um, an education, a mandatory education program for condominium board members. Currently, all they have to do is sign an affidavit saying that they read the condo docs and boom, they become uh, board members. And that's a tremendous responsibility. Uh, I think that uh, these people need to have um, some, at least some minimum education uh, with regards to reserve studies and other topics that they're going to be facing as board members. Uh, the other bill would uh, require the DBPR to create a database of condominium information, which would include the names of all the board members of that board, um, who, with, which management company they use, if any, um, their annual um, approved budget, if there's any um, just um, studies that have been done, Reserve. So it's going to be a very comprehensive database um, that, that if, if the bill passes. And last but not least, um, I have a condo fraud task force bill that would um, basically enable the state attorney to um, actually prosecute a lot of the cases that um, that come through their office. So I think uh, that's just three of many other bills that I'm sure will be filed uh, in the state of Florida. And we will follow them here on Local 10. They sound positive and useful to me anyway, so we'll see what happens up there. Wait Chevron so Jones, Anna Maria Rodriguez, so good to speak with you, and we will see you, or at least Glenna will see you, in Tallahassee during the session. <laughs> and I look that forward to good. that. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. All right, up next, Florida Democrats are plotting strategy for a big comeback in next year's elections. Offense or defense or both? The state party chief is next. Last weekend, the leaders of the Florida Democratic Party met in Orlando to plot strategy for winning the 2022 elections. With a new leader in the past year, the party's money situation and structure straightened out. But Democratic candidates are already in defense mode, heading toward the 22 midterms. Manny Diaz is that new leader, chair of the Florida Democrats since the beginning of the year. Great to have you on the program. Welcome. Manny, good to see you. Thank Great to you for your time. Great to be with both of you. Thank you for inv inviting me. Uh, Manny, uh, we should say, or I should say personally, that uh, I, I'm not speaking as a partisan, but um, uh, the future for Democrats in the state of Florida next year, frankly, does not look <clears throat> very bright. You and your fellow Democratic leaders uh, strategized last weekend. What is your plan? Well, you know, it's in, well. Number one, you and I, we've we've discussed uh, and Glenn mentioned the, the the structural piece of this. I mean, we we've raised more money uh, this year than in any previous off year. Uh, we have built an organization already uh, bigger than any organization we've had before in an off year, and we're ramping up. Uh, we're you know we're we're working to we're we're working to get that uh, that functioning. We're building the army uh, statewide. Uh, we've had a tremendous amount of support this past weekend. Um, uh, messaging is also a very important element uh, to me. And, and last week uh, at, our, at our convention, I think the message was very clear about what Florida Democrats are and what Florida Democrats represent. And as you both know, putting five Democrats in a room usually brings with it some drama and some, di <laughs> and some discord. And we had we had a thousand people at this convention. And I'm here to tell you that uh, everybody got along. There was no drama, no yeah. discord. It was, not, to... it was not a circular firing squad. <laughs> no, no, exactly. Not at all. <laughs> so I'm very, I'm very happy with that. And it tells it's I think it's a good sign for the future. I don't know. Drama is never a bad thing, is it? So <laughs> well, 
<laughs> so here's here here's some I, it had to be disheartening news. Uh, good for Republicans in Florida, not so good for Democrats in Florida. That for the first time in recent history, uh, recently the <clears throat> Republican registered voters outnumber registered Democrats. Um, that trend has been slowly creeping up and, and tipped the scales. It has been an aggressive voter registration outreach by the Republicans. Um, you're shaking your head. Go no, ahead. Like, what? I, I'm not even going to ask the question. What? Well, no, but I, I know what you're asking. And, and obviously, in, in, in your prior segment, I, I heard um, uh, an answer, a question and an answer, both of which mentioned uh, marketing. And this has been a marketing ploy that, that has been going on since the beginning of the year. It is not ex unexpected. By the way, I will acknowledge the fact that over the course of the last 10 years, Democrats completely blew it and, and just you know, went on vacation and stopped registering people to vote. Totally acknowledge that. However, what you're seeing this year and quite possibly what you've seen in, <clears throat> to some extent in prior years has nothing to do with an aggressive voter registration program and people out on the streets. They control the Secretary of State's office. They control most of the, sec uh, the uh, division of, of elections locally. And what you're seeing is a, a, an enormous number of Democrats who are being taken off the active list and placed on the inactive list. Now, an inactive person on an inactive list is still an eligible voter. They can show up on Election Day next November or any time between now and next November and actually vote, even though they are, quote, inactive. So in terms of eligible voters, Democrats still have a majority. But again, I'll acknowledge the fact that we haven't done our work. We've cranked it up. That's what our statewide structure is doing right now. And we're not going to get caught like this. We're going to keep going now. And it's going to be an every year effort. Yeah. Uh, not to get put too fine a point on it, but I checked the, uh, the, the state division of elections this morning. Right now, there are 5,120,000 Republican registered voters and 5,100 Democrats, 3.8 million no party affiliation. So they are, at least according to the state, 20,000 voters ahead of uh, the Democrats. I mean, many, that's, no, that, that's not insignificant. No, it's not insignificant, Michael. But, but again, the, the, the numbers that you're looking at are active voters. Those don't include eligible. They're not eligible voters. Eligible voters also included active voters. But like I said, Look, whether it's 20 going one way or 20 going the other way. By the way, when when um, President Obama won the primary, the uh, the state here in 2012, the Democratic advantage was somewhere between five and six hundred thousand voters, mm -hmm. and he won by seventy five thousand votes. This is a this is a purple state. It's about the messaging. It's about the candidate. Uh, the registration certainly has a bearing. But I'm prepared to outwork everybody on the other side, and we're prepared to outmessage the other side because the message on the other side, I still don't know what the message on the other side is, by the way, other than the fact that the governor keeps creating a boogeyman so that he can slay them and protect and then proclaim victory in the name of freedom. Ask the professors at the University of Florida how freedom works in the state of Florida. Another segment for another show, but point well taken. <laughs> um, so message and money. So let's talk about money for a moment. There have been Democratic um, consultants, um, I'm going to label consultants, who yes. have said behind the scenes they think that Governor DeSantis is unbeatable this year. They've said those words. Um, so you have a primary <clears throat> coming up. You have um, Nikki Freed, Agriculture Secretary, Congressman Charlie Crist, Annette Tadeo, who is in the Senate now. Uh, all seasoned Democratic politicians, all well-known, all vying in the primary. So will this f first fight among friends hamper financially going into the general, any whoever the candidate is for the Democrats? Well, not if last weekend was any indication. All three of them were there. They all spoke at multiple <clears throat> times at, at all of our events. Uh, I know they've known each other for a long time. Obviously, you know, Charlie and Annette uh, ran together as a ticket. Uh, and and I, I, the impression I get is that they get along, they're going to fight over ideas. This is not going to get personal because they understand that the person who gets the nomination has to do so from a position of strength in order to be in order to get elected in November. So I'm, I'm not I'm not uh, concerned about that at all. Yeah. Uh, Manny, I know that uh, you have the ear of uh, Nikki and Charlie and Annette. Uh, have you, when last weekend, did you have a moment to sort of say to them, when we get down to the short strokes, please don't destroy each other? Because that is the history, not just among Democrats, but Republicans in a really heated primary. 
where the candidates cut each other up so badly they can't recover for the general election. Yeah, I've, we we have, and and I look, they're they're very, you know, number one, they're very smart people. Number two, they're very committed Democrats. And number three, the real enemy here is is Ron DeSantis, and and I think they're all focused on that. So I don't think that that's a message that is not understood uh, by any one of the three. So you talked about messaging. Messaging really intrigues me because we we are the conduit for what every entity wants a message to be, and then for us to broadcast what we challenge the narrative of that message. So messaging is key. It's going on right now. Um, and so let's just say that Democrats are going to vote Democrat and Republicans are going to vote Republican. What message do you give and who, who are those people who are going to hear the message who are still swayable, undecided? I mean, the, the state is now with third no party affiliation independent voters who, who are you reaching with the message and how well uh, first i'll talk i'll talk about the democratic the, the democratic side and and the reason why i became a democrat you know a few years ago shall we say but you know as a as a young uh, immigrant uh, child uh, who could barely speak any english uh, whose parents were working three jobs um, uh, you know three jobs at a time uh, who place such a strong value on education, who place, you know, a strong value on, on health and, and creating a life, a better life for their children, um, you know, appealing to, to working class families, uh, talking about, you know, improving and excelling at our educational system, talking about, you know, safe neighborhoods, uh, the kinds of things that, that, I, that, that I and my parents were very focused on and that I, I suspect that, you know, most Floridians are still very focused on, whether or not, by the way, they live in an urban area or a rural area. We have to talk to everybody and we have to talk about why the Democratic Party has always taken the position of being right and just and being fair and doing things that are fair. And if, uh, you know, we, you were talking about Medicaid earlier, if, if, uh, if, if a grandmother can't get health treatment, health care, I think most of us believe that that grandmother should be able to get health care. Yeah. That if a child is failing in school, that we should invest in schools and do something. Early childhood, for example, that you talked about. You know, Americans are a generous and a fair people. And the Democratic Party has carried that mantra. And I will acknowledge that over the last few years, some of that has been lost. But we're going to bring that back. And that, to me, is what being a Florida Democrat is all about. Yeah. Many, the mantra now of the Republican Party, at least in Florida, is that Democrats are socialists, that they practice socialism. And we've already seen from the DeSantis campaign, uh, they have labeled all three of the uh, Democrats who are running socialists. Uh, and you're going to hear that much more as the months go on towards Election Day, what is, what is your answer? What is the answer from Democrats when you hear the accusation of socialists? Well, being levied against a person like me, for example, is extremely offensive. Because Ron DeSantis, is, he wouldn't know a socialist if, if it hit him in the forehead. Okay, I'm, I am a family that, that had to flee a country because of a communist socialist, socialistic system. So don't come to talk to me about what is and what isn't communist or socialist. And, and here's the thing. What I, you know, what I keep going back to is we were talking about messaging. What is their plan? What, what solutions do the, do the Republicans offer other than, you know, conspiracy theories? I mean, look, look at the legislation they passed, an anti-protest law, okay, which has already been, you know, to criminalize free speech, uh, you know, mandating what a private sector, what a private company can do, uh, getting rid of sanctuary cities that don't exist because we don't have any. You know, now, now there's a new elections fraud. They're going to have a bunch of sheriffs walking around for, to, to do what? Because according to the governor and according to our former president, last year's Florida elections were the safest, best ever, 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 right? Now, all of a sudden, we need to spend money to create that. You, you, you mentioned you, earlier. You know, you acknowledge that there is a significant segment of the population who really does believe in all of those things. I mean, this is philosophical divide on full display. You know, I actually don't believe that the majority of people believe those things. I, what I do believe is that people care about their children, people care about their jobs, people care about paying their rent, people care about getting health care, people care about their families. That's what people care about. 
Yeah. I mean, I don't, I, I'm telling you, there aren't a whole bunch of people in Florida clamoring to have a state militia. Or there aren't a whole bunch of people in Florida clamoring to protect our borders, which I didn't know needed to be protected in Florida. And those are the, those are the demagogic, uh, pandering, whining things that we hear from this governor. But I have yet to hear, in the third largest state in the country, by the way, we're certainly not acting like the third largest state in the country, how we get to the next level, how Florida becomes, just like you know, mayors do it at the city level. How do we take this state to the next level? It isn't by creating state militias. It isn't by creating a bunch of election sheriffs now. It isn't by pandering to, um, you know, to uh, protecting borders. I mean, seriously, come on now. What is the plan? And what we need to do as Democrats is we need to fill in what that message should be yeah. and well, how, we, you, how we make people's lives better in the state of Florida. And I think that's a good point in which to end. And that should be the point, I think, for all people offering themselves for public office. How Correct. can we make the lives better of the people we serve? Manny Diaz, always great to speak with you. You Thanks and I so go back to the days of salad, Spanish-American League Against Discrimination. You were a, a few a, years ago. <laughs> a young lawyer. I was a young reporter. Here we are now. And you're both still yes. young. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> Thanks, Manny. Appreciate it. Bye, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Next up, crisis in Kentucky. South Floridians on the ground there in the tornado's aftermath. Their effort to help the victims, that is next. Now just a little more than 24 hours since brutal tornado winds demolished paths through six states. Search and rescue efforts are underway for the unaccounted for, though recovery efforts for those presumed dead also underway. This video right here in from Mayfield, Kentucky. Look at that damage, hmm. devastation really as far as you can see. This time, South Floridians are watching from the outside. So many here too familiar firsthand with sudden catastrophic loss, especially from devastating windstorms. And some from South Florida are on the ground there in the Midwest and Kentucky at this moment to assist and help. They're preparing to deliver hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of badly needed supplies. Michael Capone is the director of the Global Empowerment Mission that is based in Doral. And we were hoping to speak with Michael live, but as you can imagine, cell service is very spotty and we have not been able to connect with him this morning. So we're gonna turn to Local 10's Parker Branton, who has more for This Week in South Florida. This local organization says that they saw the damage that was done and they got to work. They're loading up 18 wheelers and getting ready to head up north. We'll be sending a series of uh, 18 wheeler trucks uh, there from UC Group with supplies. South Florida organization Global Empowerment Mission is heading to Kentucky to help those affected by the devastating tornadoes. Almost a half million dollars worth of supplies will be loaded onto trucks at their Doral location. You have uh, these boxes, which are our uh, family necessities kits, which have uh, like a hygiene box, which have uh, food, which have snacks, which have PPE, which have blankets. You know, it's very cold there right now. It's like 30 degrees at night. Founder Michael Capone says Jim has become a regional supplier of emergency goods. They quickly got to work when they saw the damage spread over hundreds of miles and knew hundreds more are needing help. These trucks are expected to leave late today and early tomorrow morning. If you would still like to donate, there is time to do so. You can go to our website, local10.com, for information on how to do that. We're in Doral. I'm Parker Branton, Local 10 News. Parker, thanks. All right, up next, a chat with Mario Cristobal. Yes, a sports segment on This Week in <laughs> South Florida. We have the big story when we come back. If you are a football fan, especially a Miami Hurricanes fan, yes, count me, then the big story of the week was hiring Manny Cristobal as the head coach there at the U. Oh, if that's a, something it, like that. <laughs> you know, if it's the big story of the week, it is right here on This Week in South Florida. Cristobal is a Miami native. He is now considered one of the best football coaches in the country, and he spoke with Local 10 Sports Director Will Manso. Walking through these doors, again, seeing the U 
you know, seeing this campus. What did that mean to you? Well, I never saw this before. No, this campus this has changed. Yeah. yeah, I never had an indoor. I mean, if it was raining and lightning outside, we were practicing, right? So it's right away, memories are stirred up. And so much time invested in so many people that I invested time with. So, man, that, that hits you. And it hits your heart, right in the heart, right between the eyes. And it just further emphasizes the importance of the urgency to work at, at, at our best capacity, at our highest levels, to generate what we need to, to make sure that we elevate the standards and everything that goes with it here at the University of Miami. I know you've been, you know, at Bama and, and, and your opportunity at FIU and then going on to Oregon, and those places had your heart and your soul, but deep inside, right, the soul was always of a hurricane. And you watch from afar this program not be where it wants to be. How much are you, I guess, the pride you have to know you've been entitled to be the guy that could hopefully bring something close to what this program standard is? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the best thing we could do is is really understand what the current college football landscape is and the things that have made those programs successful and it's been about the investment you know it's been about people being completely in and that's what it's going to take and I know a lot of times a player so wherever I go wherever I coach players I'll ask about the you coach tell me about the you tell me about the you I go man it was a different day and age you know we didn't have a weight room we had a and like a tricep machine and a bow flex in the corner so it was different and it's changed so much that knowing that we can take those steps like some of the programs have around the country to really enhance what ends up being performance on the field uh, player development off the field personal development as well yeah it's i'm, I'm excited beyond words man i want to get to work you know we a talent base like this the players that are currently on the team, the amount of development that we can do with them and with what we have planned for them. We have a full blueprint of how this thing works. And it's difficult. I mean, it'll test you. It'll challenge you. It'll, it'll make you think if you really love football or not. And, uh, but I can't wait to, to implement it, and I can't wait to get with these guys. What gives you confidence you could do it and do it quickly because, you know, the patience runs thin in this town and, and with this program. Everybody wants to win now. Well, then everybody needs to pour into it as well. You know, and I'll, I'll make it. I'll make that the call out to the fans and the support system. You know, when it works, when recruits come to town, and they feel the energy and the support of the fans and the people that surround the program, the community, and um, that's always been key in being great here at Miami. It's been key in all the places that are doing really well right now. Well, the confidence is not only in, in myself, but in a blueprint, a blueprint that has stood the test of time. And that's, going to, that's what's going to be the critical part, the work. We've got to get to work. There's going to be no claiming. We're not going to proclaim championships, claim to be the best. We're going to invest and work at it. That's going to be the secret sauce. What's next for you from now to oh, everything? We'll, this next week, 10 days, will look a, a little bit like this. We'll, we'll try to solidify the rest of the class for the early signing period, um, get with players in between to get to know them, meet them, talk to them, especially guys that have looming NFL decisions. Um, stay away from the practices, let the, let the players and the coaches finish what they started out of respect and then focus on staffing as well. So it'll be simple days, you know, like 4 a.m. to midnight, it's no big deal. That's what you're used to the last 20 plus. <laughs> That's our sports guy, Will Manso, making his This Week in South Florida debut. Thanks, Will. <laughs> we'll be right back. Thank you so much for being here with us this hour. Remember, we are online, local10.com, 24-7. And remember, as always, stay informed, get involved. Have a great day.